Um, thanks very much for coming out on a Saturday afternoon, a sunny Saturday afternoon, the first one in a long time, um, to hear about Roman gladiators. Um, and I guess it's a sign of the enduring fascination with this phenomenon that you're all here uh, to hear me talk about them. Sometime in the middle of the first century CE, Marcus Attilius took to the sands of the arena for the first time. Attilius was not a slave, but a freeborn volunteer gladiator, what the Romans called an autoratus, fighting under contract. He was trained as a mermelo, a type of gladiator armed with a short sword, a large shield, and a rather elaborate plumed, visored, and wide-brimmed helmet. Uh, his left forward leg was padded and fronted with an iron plate, while his right sword arm was also heavily padded. His torso and abdomen were exposed. Facing Attilius across the sands was a slave gladiator from one of the premier training schools in Italy, the Neronian Ludus, that was the Latin term for a training school, which is located somewhere in the vicinity of the city of Capua. He was called Hilarus, or the Joker, and he was armed as a Thrax, the standard opponent of the Mermelo. Thrax carried a bent stabbing sword, a, a smaller shield. He wore also a plumed, visored, and wide-brimmed helmet, and he had rather fashionable hip-high padding and greaves on his legs. Like the Mermelo, his torso was exposed. Now, the Joker already had 14 fights and 12 wins under his belt, and this was Attilius' first fight. So on paper, this looked like, uh, this, you know, appeared to be a gross mismatch. But astonishingly, Attilius prevailed. The Joker put on such a good show, however, that he was released on appeal to the spectacle sponsor, with no doubt significant input from the crowd. And we know about these events from a graffito etched into a tomb outside the Nucarian Gate in Pompeii. The fighter's equipment is clearly discernible. You can see the large shield and small sword of Attilius. There's his name. Uh, and the information beside them, the actual text, gives us the details of their pedigree to date. So you have Marcus Attilius. There's M. Attilius. T for Tyro, which means first time, at, uh, first time on the sand. We leave the V aside for the moment. Here we see Hilarus, the Joker. Nair stands for Neronianus of the Neronian Training School. Uh, X, I, F, V stands for 14. Backwards, C stands for Coronatus, or winner, or crowned. And for some reason, it's been cut off at the side here. I don't know if that's a problem. Uh, but it says X, I, I over here. So winner in 12 of those 14 fights. And the final notations are V for Weekit, he won, and M for Misus, he was dismissed when he appealed. Now, immediately uh, below this uh, particular inscription, the same fan presumably etched Attilius' next bout. Another apparent gross mismatch, this time against a contract fighter like himself, Lucius Recius Felix, who was unbeaten in 12 fights, you can see, uh, oh, well, you can't, because it's uh, not quite projecting correctly. Maybe we can fix that for the ratio, I think, it's of the image. Um, but, uh, it's, it says off the side here, Lucas Reckius Felix, and it says XII, backwards C, XII. 12 fights and 12 wins, so he's unbeaten. He has never been defeated. Um, and you can also note how Attilius's record has been updated. Marcus Attilius, one fight, backwards C, one win. And again, you can see now that now that you know how to read these things, that Attilius once again emerges victorious, and you might just be able to make it. Well, you can't really. But there's an M there, meaning that uh, Felix was also released after the fight. So uh, these humble graffiti, I think, reveal a lot about the culture of the Roman arena, the different styles and statuses of the fighters, arena fans uh, charting the careers of their favorites, and the implication that skill and expertise were being appreciated in the stands rather than raw bloodlust sated. In neither fight, you will note, was there a fatality, but someone thought the fights sufficiently awesome to spend time etching them into a tomb outside the Macarian Gate in Pompeii. This last point rather goes against the, the, the modern reimaginings uh, of gladiatorial bouts, where the fights are chaotic free-for-alls with limbs and heads flying, uh, and the winner is the last man standing. Now, how people come, uh, sorry, uh, how people consume violent entertainment is a, is a very complex question. What I want to focus on here this afternoon is just one aspect of this phenomenon in one culture, the way the gladiatorial bouts were packaged for the Roman audience. 
For all their real violence, the games were hedged about by theatricality and artificiality at every turn. What this might mean for our understanding of what was going on in the stands. Can we, can we do that? Yeah, okay. I'm going to have to have a quick pause uh, to deal with a technical matter. Anyway, uh, what this might mean for our understanding of what was going on in the Roman arena is a matter that we'll deal with when we return uh, uh, and we come back to at the end of the talk. Uh, but first, uh, what do I mean by uh, the issues of theatricality and artificiality? Well, firstly, there's the way that the gladiators were equipped. Now, we've already seen the Mermelo and the Thrakes, uh, but there were many other types, perhaps two dozen or so thus far identified in the record. Uh, one of the most recognizable, if and when we get back to it, <laughs> is the Retiarius, who will be appearing any minute now. Please don't demand that, that my throat be cut, which was the normal demand if the crowd was unhappy with the performance of gladiators. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe it won't affect us too much. Maybe we'll be able to proceed. If there are significant um, bits missing at the edge, I'll fill them in with uh, my excellent powers of description. Right, here is our Retiarius. He is the net man, and probably the most emblematic and famous gladiator of them all today. Uh, he's the only unhelmeted gladiator. He's largely unarmored. He hasn't got a shield or anything like that. Uh, and he carries, he, he has this rather strange device on his shoulder called a galerus, which looks like that. There's one, actually, that, that's an actual one from the, uh, from, from the museum in Naples. Uh, and as well as that, the arm below the galerus on his shoulder is heavily padded in the same way as, uh, as the Mermelos was. Uh, he carries, uh, as an offensive weapon, a net, which is a very strange thing. Uh, and a trident, a three-pronged fork, which you see lying on the ground here, the net here ensnaring his opponent. And he has, as a secondary weapon, a dagger, which he's wielding here, attempting to fend off his opponent. Uh, this one, my, this is actually one of my favorite gladiators. Obviously, spends a lot of time in the gym, possibly acquainted with steroids. Uh, and uh, he is, as I say, uh, chasing his opponent with his dagger. He's dropped his trident, you see, at his feet, and is trying to finish the job uh, with his dagger. Now, uh, the opponent of the Retiarius was called the Secutor, which means the follower. Um, uh, and he was kitted out, and it's very, very similar to the Mermelo. He has a large shield, padded foreleg, padded arm, short sword. But his helmet is smooth rather than being fancy and wide brimmed with, with uh, um, all kinds of bits attached. And it's visored. You see, it opens up. There's a model of one, a little uh, um, toy, little sort of G.I. Joe figure for, uh, for, a, for a Roman child that opens up. Um, and obviously, the reason for the smooth helmet, I think, is pretty obvious. Um, you don't want to go in against a guy wielding a net with a helmet with lots of bits sticking out the top, uh, because that way the fight will be over in a matter of seconds. Uh, one of the strangest uh, gladiators is the Schisor, uh, our slicer, our carver, who has this uh, rather ominous-looking helmet. But really noticeable is this cuff on his left arm, which ends in this brutal-looking blade. Uh, which gave him his Greek name, the Arbalas, which means the cobbler's tool, because this, because this uh, resembled a cobbler's tool to the Greek mind. So I could go on, but the point, I think, is this is, is fairly clear, that gladiators were not armed in the fashion of any known warriors from any ancient battlefield, uh, but rather they uh, wielded equipment that was specifically designed for the requirements of the exhibition they were a part of. The graffiti about Marcus Attilius reveal another theatrical aspect uh, of arena culture. Gladiators' names, like Attilius' first, uh, uh, like first opponent, Hilarus, the Joker, slave gladiators normally carried single names that were often evocative, sexy, or somewhat sarcastic. So we have ferox, meaning savage, or fierce, pugnax, fighter, uh, punchy, perhaps, Scorpio, the stinger, uh, or there's Cupido and Eros, that both means lust, or Pulker, pretty boy, uh, or, or as the gladiator called Clemens, merciful, or Columbus, the dove, or Moranus, perfume boy, presumably because he was pampered. Now, by way of comparison, uh, think about the names of professional wrestlers, uh, like The Undertaker, uh, or The Rock, or the single names of Brazilian soccer players who all seem to be called Ronaldo. Uh, indeed, uh, 
Here's the rock. There he is looking fearsome. Um, now the rock's real name is the somewhat less intimidating Dwayne Douglas Johnson, uh, while the undertaker is really Mark William Calloway. And in the movies, we know Mark, Mark Vincent better as Vin Diesel, which is somewhat harder than Mark Sinclair Vincent. Now, stage names like this are all part and parcel of showmanship, and the gladiators use them is therefore revealing. Uh, even fighters who use their regular names, like Mark Satilius, uh, or even Lucas Reckes Felix, they really did that as part of the show, because the real name made plain to the audience the freeborn or freed status of the fighter, and his presence in the show as a volunteer autoratus contract fighter. Uh, putting on a good show was a matter of life and death for gladiators. If they fell, or they were injured, or disarmed, they would raise a finger, as you see going on here, to appeal to the game sponsor. Now, at that point, once they've turned away and they've raised a finger, they have lost the fight. It'll go down in their record as a loss. And what has to be decided now is whether the gladiator lived or died. And the sponsor would stand up in his box, and the crowd would issue its opinion by shouting out yugala, yugala, which means cut his throat, or misus misus, meaning dismissal. And they would, just, and they would gesticulate in some way with their thumbs. Uh, we don't know what that actual uh, uh, signal was. The usual one today, of course, is let him live or let him die or kill him. Um, we don't really know. The Latin, is, uh, the Latin phrase is very vague. It just says, with the thumb turned. We don't know what direction the thumb was turned in, up or down, in or out. It's very hard to say. Uh, but nevertheless, um, this is what happened. So the crowd would be issuing its, uh, its sort of judgment on, on, on the performance. And the sponsor, since the sponsor had spent an enormous amount of money on this display, precisely to win what was called the favor populi, the uh, uh, favor of the people, the, 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 the um, general popularity, would tend to agree with their judgments, unless the sponsor was Caligula, uh, who deliberately went against the crowd's wishes every time just to annoy them. Now, there are two considerations here that really uh, merit some cons uh, uh, further thought. First, the combats proceeded according to rules and regulations, and umpires were on hand, as you can see here, uh, to see that those rules were enforced. And second, the crowd was knowledgeable about these rules, but also was knowledgeable about gladiatorial combat moves. So they were in a position to be able to assess a good performance from a bad one. In fact, the Christian writer Tertullian in the third century said that spectators would actually shout out combat tips to gladiators as they engaged. And Cicero writes to his friend Atticus, who was going to put on a show of gladiators, and this is Cicero writing, he says, you might, uh, you might write to me about your gladiators, but only if they acquit themselves well. If not, I'm not interested. Why he has an English accent, I don't know, but never mind. Um, so in other words, uh, it's assumed there that uh, you know what a good fight looks like and uh, how, the, you know, how the actual uh, uh, fight proceeds is something that the, that, that, that the crowd can assess and judge. They demonstrate, I think, these kinds of comments that spectators were there to watch a performance, the protocols and practices of which they were familiar with and the quality of which they were in a position to assess when judging appeals. Gladiators must have known all this. Cicero comments that they were, in fact, inculcated by their trainers with the prime objectives of pleasing the crowd and pleasing their owners above all else. So gladiators were, above all, showmen. We might identify moments of showmanship in arena scenes like this, uh, where we see a victorious gladiator having to be physically restrained from finishing off his opponent as everyone looks off to the side to see what the sponsor's decision is. Uh, or here, where we've just seen this scene, the uh, umpire intercedes his cane, which he, he's carrying to tap them on the back and so on. Between the two gladiators, one has been defeated. He's raising his finger, turning away from the fight. He's dropped his shield. The, the, uh, the umpire steps forward and intercedes his cane behind the back, while the winner adopts what I can only call a statuesque heroic stance, uh, awaiting the decision. He's standing back, the crowd no doubt cheering his victory, uh, waiting to decide, or you know, waiting to hear what to, what, uh, what to do with his opponent. Here's a big arena relief that's in the Naples Museum today. It's from a tomb outside Pompeii. And we're interested in this scene where we see, uh, again, the winner standing, raising his sword in victory, the umpire standing between himself and his fallen opponent, who's been helped up by five assistants. Similarly here, a fallen opponent and, his, and, and the winner raising his shield to, uh, to accept the crowd's accolades. Or here, a, a fallen 
uh, Sukut Hor and the Retiaris with his dagger, with both hands raised aloft, exulting uh, over, his, over his opponent. Gladiator epitaphs are also very instructive in this regard, the epitaphs of dead gladiators, because they include in this example of Flama the Sukutor, so Flama meaning the flame, that's his name, that's his stage name. You see he lived 30 years, he fought 34 times, he won 21 times, drew nine times, and here's the key part, was spared Mises four times, so he's saying that this guy lost these four fights, uh, but he was spared uh, uh, on appeal to the crowd. So I think what these reflect is an oblique acknowledgement of the skill of Flama in showmanship, in, in his ability to put on a good enough show, uh, that when he lost, uh, the crowd didn't order him killed. It also, of course, reflects pride on the part of Flama and his friend Delicatus, which means pet, a gladiator called Pet, um, in making this dedication to him. Uh, finally, uh, we know that the fights began with blasts of trumpets, uh, and they may indeed have proceeded, here's a band, you see, uh, they may have proceeded to a musical accompaniment. There may have been a gladiatorial soundtrack, uh, or, or at least perhaps certain pieces of music that played at key moments in the fight, as when an appeal was being decided, as we see here. Was there like an appeal being decided jingle uh, or something? So all of these features then of gladiatorial spectacles speak to a high degree of theatricality in the shows. But the most striking element in this respect surely arena stagecraft, which we now turn our attention to. A very basic observation is that arena games took place in their own dedicated space. The amphitheater, a most famous example, of course, at the Colosseum in Rome, was a form of building that had been specifically designed and evolved for the requirements of these kinds of spectacles. But other venues could be utilized as well. If you couldn't afford an amphitheater, you could use a theater. Uh, you could use a circus if you had one. A circus was primarily designed for chariot racing. This is the Circus Maximus in Rome. Here we see at the top left uh, a beast hunt going on, and there are various bits of scenery around about. But particularly noteworthy is this gateway with the seven eggs on top, which we know stood in the Circus Maximus in Rome. Those seven eggs were used to mark the, 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 the laps, the seven laps that chariots did during a typical chariot racing arena. So this beast. Uh, and we see that going on here, by the way. Here are those seven eggs on that gateway with a chariot race going on. You see the chariots racing around? So this beast hunt is taking place uh, in the circus rather than in the Colosseum or in the arena. Or even in Stadia in the Greek East, where the Greeks uh, like to do things like running and discus throwing and uh, javelin throwing, so Greek-style athletics. They had their own kinds of venues for those events. They were called Stadia. They're kind of like uh, the the uh, circuses, except they, they don't have a middle uh, spine up the middle. Um, and even um, here as well, gladiatorial games could be staged. But in, in every instance, in these secondary uses, the space was modified for the needs of the gladiatorial spectacle. So in theaters, for instance, often, the lower layer of seats, the lower area of seats will be filled in so that a podium wall can be erected, because you do want some distance between you and the fierce animals that are going <laughs> that are being put on display are, you don't want to be splashed with the blood that's flying and so forth. Um, and so this is a requirement of the arena, and we see here a theater, this is at Xanthos in, um, in Turkey, where a theater has been modified. Ah, uh, we can see um, here, this is at ASOS also in Turkey, there are these slots for, 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 where nets could be put up in front of the seats, again, to keep animals away uh, from, the, from the audience, but you could see through the nets and see what was happening. Or here's a stadium, this one at Perge, again in Turkey. You see, I've been to Turkey recently, so I took a lot of shots. Anyway, uh, here is the uh, end of the, uh, of the stadium in Turkey. And again, you can see two things. The podium wall has been added. Look how the seats here have been filled in up here to make the podium wall. And then they've walled off the, the, bullet, the rounded end uh, of the stadium to create a gladiatorial arena there. So um, the... the, the uh, sort of gladiatorial games took place in a very particular kind of space, and uh, even in secondary uses, that space had to be properly created for the games to proceed. But even more striking than this uh, was the intricacy and extravagance of stage sets deployed to enhance the shows. Now, scenery had always been a part of the theater. Think of Socrates hanging from a basket in Aristophanes' uh, The Clouds, which was uh, uh, um, put on in Athens in the 5th century BC. But now stagecraft was adopted by and also adapted for use in these large-scale arena spectacles. 
The arena could be pre-equipped with sets and, and uh, other kinds of enhancements for the show. Strabo reports how, in a spectacle staged in the Roman Forum during the reign of the Emperor Augustus, a Sicilian bandit by the name of Silurus was placed on a scaffold that had been fashioned to look like Mount Etna, the largest mountain in Sicily, which then suddenly collapsed and deposited them into fragile cages of wild animals, which tore them apart. Later, the Emperor Septimius Severus began a, a, a hunt with a huge set in the form of a ship that broke apart and released hundreds of animals into the arena area in a single go. And the writer Apuleius, a novelist, describes a vast painted and movable set in the shape of a house that was built by the prisoners who were fated to be exposed to the animals that the house set contained. Uh, ancient art provides images such as this remarkable relief from Sofia uh, in Bulgaria, which shows an animal hunt. We see uh, several bears, a lion, a crocodile, you can see particularly here, and a bull are all recognizable as performers, as are various people, including a chap up here who boxes bears uh, for a living. He's called the Nursarius, or bear man. Uh, here's a relief from Istanbul that shows uh, two of these guys in action, one boxing fist to fist with the bear and one taking one on wrestling style, uh, while uh, attendants carry whips. But more informative for our purposes are the stage sets and other devices that are depicted uh, in the relief. Over here on the far left of the slide, you might be able to make out this rather curious looking set. This is a uh, double compartment on a raised platform with two people beating things, round things on the bottom. And in the middle compartment is a seated figure with a compliant animal at her feet, uh, an enthroned female figure. And up here is a topless female figure admiring herself in, the, in a mirror and doing her hair. Um, now these are likely deities. This is probably Kibele, or the great mother goddess. Uh, who is normally shown enthroned and with lions uh, at her side. She comes from Anatolia. And this, uh, well, the goddess who's most impressed with her own appearance is, of course, Venus, uh, the god of love or whatever. And if this is Kibele, then these people down here are the Corybants, the ecstatic uh, uh, worshippers of Kibele, who beat shields or drums uh, as they drive themselves into a kind of trance in her worship. So this then would be a set, uh, set up, it looks like, to display the gods our goddesses in this case, in whose honor the games uh, are being staged. Another indication of a set is just visible here. There's a base of something, but then the stone breaks off and we can't see what that is. But if we return to the main image, uh, there are two features that warrant closer inspection here, I think. Uh, the first one, uh, the one down here on the bottom, this one here, we, clo we, we close up. Well, you can see a raised set with bunting on the front, garlands. Uh, and what's going on here is quite strange. It looks like there are people, possibly children, dressed as monkeys or baboons. They have monkey masks on. And they're carrying out parodies of arena events. Here, one monkey man is hunting, if you like, some kind of an animal that sits rather compliantly on a chair. Here we have a monkey version of the Retiarius and the Secutor fighting. Uh, and here is a monkey blacksmith. Um, and just off, if we were to go further off to the left there, there's another chap riding around on a horse, also wearing a monkey mask. By the way, there's one of the quarry bands you see beating, beating the uh, shield or drum in honor of Sibylle. Now, we know these people are called Pygniarii, these, these jokesters. They're kind of clown or a, a joke act that stage parodies of arena events, either as a warm-up act or uh, during the intervals when the sand was being raked and prepared for the next phase of the festival. And here are two again with these with, with what look like quips and... Uh, uh, padding and so on, little cudgels, uh, having a parody of, uh, um, of, the, main um, of the main action. Uh, if you return to the Sophia relief, we have this even more strange uh, looking event. We have what looks like a bear man, the Norsarius, uh, avoiding his bear by means of a strange pivoting latticed uh, arrangement that's fixed in a pole in the ground. Um, and it, it looks altogether very bizarre. Well, we see the same thing again. A little bit later on in the 6th century in these consular diptychs, these are ivory uh, book covers that were given to consuls in the late imperial era. And uh, this one it dates from 517 and is to the consul Flavius Anastasius. And down below are images and what we're interested in what's going on down here, as we see here, two more of these devices. Now, it just so happens that we have evidence, written evidence, from a witness. 
to these shows, a chap called Flavius Cassiodorus, who was living and writing in Rome at this very time, around the year 500 or so, and describes for us animal shows that were put on in the Colosseum. And here's what he writes about these particular devices. And I quote, one performer puts his trust in angled screens fitted into the ground in a four-part rotating device. He flees by not retreating. He retreats by not moving far off. He follows the beast who follows him, coming close with his knees to escape the bear's maw. So there's some knee action going on down here. You see that? So it looks like then this, these are kind of a rotating four-part, almost like uh, uh, one of those uh, uh, doors into hotels that rotate around. And you can manipulate it to avoid the bear. That you, of course, the possibility is that you may be caught by a bear. And that makes it all the more fun. Now, Cassiodorus uh, also makes mention of these three items that we see up here, these three features, guys with little, peeking out of little doors. Cassiodorus explains, and I quote, other performers dared to provoke the rage prepared against them by using a setup, so to speak, of three little doors. In the open arena, they hide behind lattice doors, showing now their faces, now their backs. So it's a wonder they escape uh, as you watch them fly among the teeth and claws of the lions. So here we have a very rare occasion where we've got a confluence of iconographic and, uh, and written evidence that the written evidence just tells us directly what we're looking at. Um, these are strange sort of gymnastic displays that are going on involving animals and uh, uh, trained performers. There's people with lassoes and so on, a guy on a horse. And there's no doubt that these were bloody events. This person down here has just gotten bitten on the leg or is about to be bitten on the leg by what might be a leopard or uh, some such animal. And Cassiodorus, in general, who's a Christian, condemns the whole event. He says he calls it this cruel game, this bloody pleasure, impious cult, and as it were, human bestiality. That's his view. He's still there watching, mind you, but he just lets you know that he doesn't approve of the whole business uh, when he writes about it afterwards. Other temporary devices are on record, such as these uh, stakes set into racing chariots on which execution victims were tied and then shoved towards the beasts that they were being exposed to, as shown in this mosaic from Libya. Uh, elsewhere in the same mosaic, um, we see a band playing. I've shown you this before, and what's noticeable is over here, there, there's a plinth with the statue bay, uh, uh, with a bust on it and a shield resting against it. This is probably the ancestor our deity, possibly, in whose honor the games are being held. So rather like the images of Kibele and Venus off to one side, uh, they're uh, um, apparently down on the sand. And then there's this strange looking thing. It looks like a cabinet or, or, or a crate of some sort. We see them in other gladiatorial images. There's one uh, down there. See, a guy is about to be. Look, there's a Thracian. See his bent sword. There are the Thrakes, uh, his opponent, and the umpire. And here again, oh, it's off screen. Unfortunately, but trust me, this is the bottom of an arrow that points to one of these strange devices. These are probably libitini, or beers, that were used to carry fallen gladiators out of the arena. Uh, and one might be tentatively identified in this uh, relief. I showed you a little part of it before. This shows a secutor and retiarius engaging. Here they are. Then at one point in the fight, the retiarius pushes the secutor against a stage set of some sort. You can see this might be one of these beers. But here's just, just like a stool, a three-footed stool with drapery on the front. Exactly what that's doing in the middle of the arena is not exactly clear. He pushes him against it, and that causes him to fall over, and then he wins the bout. Uh, now, I've mentioned a couple of times these uh, reliefs. These are from Kibera in Turkey, in southwestern Turkey. They were discovered in 2009, and as far as I know, so far have not yet been published. We're still awaiting the publication of them. So you're getting these sort of hot off the press or, I don't know, cold off the stone, perhaps, um, uh, from, from my visitation of the museum where they're displayed at this region museum, Burdur Museum in Turkey. Uh, and they appear to have, well, there, there's a close-up of the, of the pushing over scene. Right, here are the reliefs. They appear to have formed a balustrade around a cemetery of arena performers. And they date to about the third century or so uh, CE. We see a lot of very interesting things in these images. Uh, we see performers that are quite reminiscent of Cassiodorus's late imperial gymnasts. This chap is pole vaulting over an animal. Uh, there's a close-up, right? You can see he's pole vaulting. And that's actually an event that Cassiodorus mentions too. There are pole vaulters. You put a lion, you have to get, you have to pole vault.
vault over. Fun if the pole breaks or you mistime it. Um, here's a person riding rodeo. Here's the bull with the head turned back, and he's up riding the rodeo, just like you'd see if you went to Calgary or somewhere um, to watch rodeos. But we also see um, animals being released from crates. Here with the chap on top pulling the, pulling the door open. Here's a beast coming out, prowling out of the crate, being released in, into the arena. But what's going on over there <laughs> at left? Uh, this is an extraordinary device. This is a stage set. It's very rare to have images this clear of arena stage sets. So I, I was really quite excited when I actually whooped out loud in this very small museum and people were looking at me. Um, so I was like, oh my god, I've never seen that before. I took lots of photographs. It's a very strange looking device. We have uh, these compartments at the top with what look like arches alternating over, over them. This uh, raking feature which comes down and through a device at the side appears linked to these triangular features below, which are themselves over these uh, pairs of, uh, it looks like compartments that are open and then below that uh, some kind of a base, a uh, slightly elaborate base. Um, so what exactly is this? Well, if we look closely at these, you might see these little notches on the sides of the, of the doors. Well, if we go back to our crate for animals, there are those same notches on that crate. So these would appear to be, if we go back, these appear to be animal cages or animal uh, crates that are opened simultaneously by virtue of these pulleys and ropes, perhaps operated by a very shadowy figure up here. That is a person maybe pulling ropes that can then open up all of these cages at once to release, in this case, six animals in a single go. Um, this seems to be the case with this even more bizarre, crazy looking device, really. I mean, look at this feature at the top of that, that's amazing. Here's a guy jumping over a boar, by the way. Um, and here is the, these strange looking devices with this, I don't know exactly what these are. Are these springs or, uh, it's very hard to know, or are they just decorative? And then again, we have these uh, notches on the side of these compartments. And out of the lower uh, right-hand one, there is a uh, beast about to emerge. So uh, really what we're looking at are um, sets that are designed to allow the simultaneous release of animals into the arena. And we've seen literary evidence for this already. Uh, we've seen Septimius Severus's ship that uh, broke apart in Rome and released hundreds of creatures into the arena all at once. Or the house set that is described by Apuleius uh, in his um, uh, novel. And speaking of the house set, look at this stage set uh, from, um, from the town of Miletus in Turkey. It's got a wheel, and the house set in Apuleius' novel is movable. It's got a wheel. It looks like a house. It looks like a house that a kid might draw. There are bears in it, though, so that's, kind of, that's what tells you it's not a house. Um, here's a bear coming out of a crate. And these, ext these extraordinary arrangement of beams at the back. And what these are, these look to me like tituli, what the Romans call tituli, are labels in, uh, that would have told you what was in each crate underneath, perhaps. Uh, I'm not exactly sure. Oh, we see this set. Uh, this, set. this is from uh, a, a mosaic from North Africa, a place called Thisdrus. You can see an execution is in progress. Uh, here's a chap with the leopard attached to his face. Um, and there's a hunt going on. And in the middle of the arena is this big stage set with four uh, posts at the corner with these military triumphal trophies uh, on them, painted to, either painted to or built out of blocks or painted to look like blocks. And you might just be able to make out there's an opening here at this end, presumably the uh, Leopards had come out of that opening. Uh, stages were also used, or stage sets were also used in gladiatorial confrontations. Uh, one format of fight involved putting a retiarius on top of a platform, uh, who then had to fend off attackers advancing up one or two ramps, uh, depending on uh, which format you preferred. In this relief from Trieste, we see a retiarius, his neck crumpled at his feet, holding his trident and his dagger simultaneously. His name is Kritos. He's up on his platform, and he's raising his hand uh, in victory. And we'll see why in a second. And uh, prowling up, uh, coming up the ramp, is his opponent, who's called Mariskos. And why he's raising his hand, why it is that Kritos is raising his hand in victory, is explained to us uh, in this Greek inscription, which is Apoluthe Exoludu, which means he was freed from the training school. So this is the fight in which Kritos won his freedom. He was a slave gladiator who performed enough times that he was released uh, upon victory. So two phases of the fight are being shown, the opening approach of the opponent, and then the celebration at the end. 
Are this relief also from the Kibra reliefs from Turkey, uh, which we see in this case only one ramp on the platform, but a retiarius on top, and two opponents uh, attacking him from each side. One has grabbed his trident, is trying to pull him down and keep it occupied, while presumably his colleague, who's working in tandem with him, approaches menacingly uh, up the ramp at the back. And when these kinds of uh, uh, shows were shown, uh, our stage, it looks like that, that the gladiators were called pontarii, or bridge fighters, uh, during these kinds of events. Now, whether these sets were fixed, prefabricated features erected in the arena for the duration of this show, or whether they were constructed as needed and then taken down again, is really something that we can't say for sure. But where the infrastructure existed, more dynamic options were available. In his 88 Epistle, uh, the writer, Roman writer Seneca, comments on the philosopher Posidonius' classification of the arts. Amusements, writes Seneca, are those which give pleasure to the eyes and the ears. Among these, you may count the machine operators, he says, who contrive stage sets that ascend on their own account, or platforms that rise silently into the air, and the other varieties of surprising device, things which were conjoined disintegrating or things that were separate, coming together of their own accord, or things that stood tall, gradually collapsing in on themselves. Such contraptions strike the eye of the inexperienced, who marvel at everything that happens without warning, since they don't know their causes. So here's an appreciation for stagecraft uh, in a variety of settings. He's talking about both the arena and, of course, regular theater. But examples uh, of these sorts of devices which Seneca describes are on record. We're told, for instance, that in the year 52, when Claudius was about to drain the Fucine Lake, uh, he staged a large naval battle, which was announced, or at least the start of it was announced, by a silver triton, a kind of sea creature rising mechanically from the middle of the lake and blowing a trumpet that told everyone that the game, you know, the game were, uh, the games were on. Apuleius, again, describes an artificial Mount Ida that rose up from the arena floor, complete with plants, running water and goats gambling on its sides, and then sank back down again out of sight. Uh, and uh, there's also uh, the sets of devices that allowed animals and performers to emerge from trapdoors in the ground, as described by the poet Calpurnius Siculus, who writes, oh my goodness, how we trembled whenever we saw the soil upturned as the arena split apart and beasts emerged from the chasm torn in the earth. And often from those same caverns, golden trees grew, or a sudden spray of perfume. End of quote. Uh, some of this scenery comprised three-dimensional objects, but others must have been painted flats that could be unfurled and refolded for rapid deployment and removal. Along with sets that rose up from the floor, Seneca mentions devices that made things ascend into the air, pegmatep. An example of this appears to be the person who was dressed as Icarus, who flew around the arena, so probably, I don't know, swinging from a pole, it's hard to know exactly uh, how this uh, uh, happened, but anyway, things didn't go right, and Icarus fell uh, and uh, hit the podium wall right beside the Emperor Nero and splattered the Emperor with blood, which was considered a bad omen. Uh, the uh, fabulist Phaedrus mentions a flute player who fell off a pegma and broke his leg, uh, and the poet Marshall describes some kind of a device that snatched a bull out of the middle of the arena and transported it into the air. And the complicated infrastructure demanded by dynamic stagecraft like this is best exemplified by the hypogeum or the basement structures of the Colosseum, viewed uh, by millions of people every year. Over the centuries, the hypogeum underwent uh, various renovations until it became the two-story high, dazzlingly complex labyrinth of walls, cells, and passageways that greets the visitor today. You can get, apparently get down there now uh, if you apply in advance for tickets. Fourteen corridors, seven on each side, uh, symmetrically flank a wider central passageway. And at the ends of that passageway, you can see our more subterranean uh, 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 chambers uh, underneath the seating. Uh, raking features can be identified here and here, sloped features in these various corridors. And these worked in tandem with the system of winches, uh, which were uh, lifting devices. Here's uh, these winches operated by two-story tall capstans. You see uh, four, four on each level would be able to winch cages up to a position right below the arena floor. And then at that point, 
uh, trap doors on these raking features would slide down to allow the animals uh, to be brought up into the performance space. Uh, thus far, about 60 of these emplacements for the, uh, for the capstans have been located in the Coliseum. There's, a, there's the actual place where the capstan was uh, uh, put in place. And in corridor B of the Hypergame, 28 such capstans have been located. So a, a lot of different stage sets, and animals and performers could uh, be popped up on the rim here. And there we go. Here's an example of that. A simple trap door. Here are trees, for instance, being popped up by means of these capstans. Now, the Colosseum is, of course, unusual in its complexity. Uh, we are dealing with the Imperial Colosseum, uh, the, 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 the Imperial Building in Rome. But other arenas elsewhere, like Merida in Spain, uh, or Taraco also in Spain. You can see here the underground arrangements. This is across uh, uh, two different corridors. This is a later church built on top, but here we see the underground arrangement of the arena. Here is El Gem in North, in North Africa. And you can see a single corridor down the middle and two trap doors. And here is uh, Putioli in Italy, which has got somewhat more complex. Still not as complex as the Colosseum. There's nothing quite as advanced as that but we see a central corridor and a series of trap doors around the side. But even in the absence of uh, any kind of underground structures, uh, practice stagehands could impress the crowd with their expertise so that inscriptions uh, commemorating games specifically boast of games that are splayed splendido ad parato. See that there? Or a magnifico ad parato, which means with fine equipment or with uh, splendid or fantastic equipment. Finally, there were ancillary attractions, such as Massilia or El Sparciones, which were prizes thrown into the crowd or sometimes perfume that would be sprinkled over the crowd. You must imagine going to a spectacle in which lots of animals and people are going to be killed in the summer in Italy when you have a quasi-roof over the building. Things are going to get rather stinky inside that building after a while, and so uh, um, perfume could be sprinkled over the crowd to keep everyone smelling nice. Um, now, the Emperor Nero uh, took this practice to the extreme, being, I guess, Nero, uh, during the games that he called the greatest games, the Ludi Maximi, which he staged in Rome over several days in several different venues in the year 59. At these games, Nero had thrown into the crowd, as the, as the spectacle proceeded, birds and food and prize tickets for grain, clothes, gems, pearls, gold and silver, slaves, paintings, draft animals, ships, apartment blocks, and farms. Well, it wasn't just emperors who could put on this kind of lavishness. Uh, an, an, an advertisement for games at Pompeii, which obviously wasn't an imperial spectacle, promised that the awning would be used and there will be sparsiones. Uh, uh, those of us who go to the occasional uh, professional baseball game may be familiar with this kinds of practice. Um, although all we get is crappy t-shirts uh, uh, rather than tickets for slaves or gems. I'm still waiting for my apartment block. So the foregoing demonstrates uh, that the audience at, um, at Roman Arena Games, and here's uh, some images, there are very few images, ancient images, of people at Arena Games. This is a mosaic, <coughs> excuse me, from uh, Cologne, uh, and these are people, it's uh, late imperial, and I, I can assure you there are, um, there's a sort of gladiatorial fight going on below. They look like Victorians because it was extremely heavily uh, uh, um, refurbished in the Victorian era. So that's why they look like they're sort of 19th century Germans going to a Roman spectacle. This is the, uh, a genuine Roman crowd uh, from one of these diptychs. Now, admittedly, they look like they've spent time in Colorado or Washington uh, with their sort of, you know, uh, stones looking expressions uh, but they're watching but they're watching what you can see is another spectacle going on down below with people throwing discs and bears uh, and they're all terribly excited anyway the foregoing demonstrates that the audience uh, um, uh, at the arena were everywhere confronted by theatricality and artificiality from the strange gear that the gladiators wore and wielded to the stage sets and dynamic machinery used to enhance the spectacle to the prizes and food tossed into the crowd the stage sets were an integral part of the show, with some arenas built to accommodate them and specialist staff on hand to service their needs. We're told that the Emperor Claudius, in fact, would throw these uh, uh, guys, who, who were called fabri or servants or artisans, 
into the arena if any of their devices fail to work. So that's <laughs> the ultimate uh, sanction from your boss. I'm sorry, that uh, didn't work out. You have to be thrown to the beasts now. And we also read, uh, as I've just shown you in inscriptions, that the uh, spectators were grateful when uh, shows were put on with all the lavish apparatus and stage sets uh, that were used to enhance the show. So what are we to make of all of this? Well, prior scholarly assessments of arena stagecraft have taken two main lines of analysis. The first links the development and use of elaborate sets to the documented quest for novelty in Roman spectacle. So Tonius, uh, the, uh, 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 the biographer of Claudius, says that heralds would announce the staging of games with the formula that people were going to see uh, uh, things that they have never seen before and never would see again. So that does rather set the bar pretty high for a sponsor uh, to find something new and interesting to put on. The quest for novelty and ever-increasing scale has been well documented by other scholars, with more and more pairs of gladiators laid on, new and exotic animals sought out, captured, brought to Rome, and displayed in the arena, and novel modes of execution devised. So increasingly uh, fancy and elaborate stage sets uh, fit neatly uh, into this pattern. The desire to show something new was further fueled by the competitive ethos among the oligarchs, emperors, and local dignitaries who, as sponsors, tried to outdo their predecessors. And this imperative is made very clear in this fantastic mosaic from North Africa, the so-called Megarius mosaic from the, from the third century, from Smirat in Tunisia, uh, that shows a uh, hunt that was staged in, in, the, in the third century by a chap called Megarius. But what we see is um, four huntsmen all named, and four leopards, which are also named, names like Luxurious and Romanus and Victor and Crispinus. Uh, and one of the huntsmen, you'll notice, specializes uh, in hunting his quarry on stilts. There he is. And uh, we, we have uh, on the sides the, 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 the crowd calling out McGarry. That's in the vocatives. That's the crowd screaming out the name of the sponsor. And this is probably the great man just off screen here. But what's, but what's very interesting is what's in the middle. We have a slave boy carrying a tray with four bags of money, presumably, and on it are the symbols uh, for 1,000. It's like an infinity symbol. Um, and there is text. And on the left, the text reads, spoken through a herald, my lords, let the telegenii, that's the name of the hunting company, the professional huntsmen who've been hired for this display, these guys with, with the stilty guy, uh, have your favors reward for each leopard killed. Give them 500 denarii. And we can see that, in fact, Megarius, showing his generosity and wealth, has doubled the amount that was asked uh, for each uh, um, huntsman and given them uh, 1,000. And over here, uh, we get the crowd crying out. It reads, ad clamatum est. And they shout it out. And in part, what they shout out is this. By your example, let future generations learn of the show and how it was staged. Let your predecessors hear about it. Where did such a show come from? When was one like it put on? As an example to the quaestors, you will put on a spectacle. You will put it on at your expense. This is your day. End of quote. Now, the acclamation states plainly that Megarius is both outdoing his predecessors, let, let your predecessors hear about this show, and setting a new standard for future sponsors as an example to the quaestors, who were local town officials, junior officials, who one day will rise up to the higher local office that will require them to put on a spectacle. In this competitive dynamic among sponsors, the requirement to find something new to exhibit drove the technical and theatrical evolution of the shows. The second line of analysis focuses on the social, cultural, and political messages implicit in the spectacles. With respect to stage sets in particular, Kathleen Coleman at Harvard, for instance, has argued cogently that they affirm for the audience the Romans' capacity to control natural forces and for the emperor to make the unreal become real. Richard Beecham, an historian of the theater, uh, likens Roman stagecraft to a fascist-style kind of aesthetic, uh, which uh, seeks to manipulate the emotions of the spectators with images and rituals of power, and so generated in them feelings of exaltation, celebration, and awe. And recently, Dean Hammer has suggested that the Roman spectacles uh, and, their, and their stage apparatus, what he calls the technology of reality, were a kind of ancient reality TV, where spectators were led to believe they were watching reality unfold before their eyes, unfiltered and unscripted. As a result, 
they enjoyed what he calls an illusion to proximity of uh, uh, sorry an illusion of proximity to power because the spectacle cast both nature and humanity as fundamentally equal by making them appear transitory, reproducible, and conformable to human desire. Now, these are all useful and illuminating perspectives, but I would think even more fundamental forces were at work. Although gladiatorial fights are unique to the Roman world, the way they are staged shares many points of contact with more familiar forms of violent or sporting spectacles. As we've seen, Roman spectacles took place in their own dedicated space. Performers used stage names. They wore helmets and costumes and wielded equipment specifically designed for the exhibition they were a part of. And there were rules of play, and there were umpires on hand to ensure that those rules of play were enforced. Stagecraft added visual pizzazz and variety, enhancing the artificiality of the context. What to make of this? Modern psychological studies have shown that people, when confronted with uh, raw images of violence, say open heart surgery or scenes from an abattoir, are generally repulsed. But when that violence is presented to them packaged and given the context as an element of a narrative or staged as part of a sporting event, the same people can readily consume it. A modern combat sport like ultimate fighting can be hideously violent. Warning on about the next slide for those of you uh, who have uh, delicate stomachs. This is a fight that took place in Las Vegas in 2007. The uh, Senate Majority Leader Harry Reid was, impre uh, was present. Now, we, we, we think many things about Harry Reid, but that he's a barbarian or a psychopath it doesn't seem to be one of those things, I would suggest. And he, he said he enjoyed this uh, uh, fight very much. That doesn't look terribly enjoyable to me. A modern sport like this can be extremely violent, but the packaging and context of the action render acceptable a degree of violence that, if it took place in an ordinary setting, would involve calling the police. In modern film, violence can often be set to music uh, or sped up or slowed down for effect and choreographed for maximum visual impact. Gladiatorial combats, remember, were accompanied by music and may have been choreographed to some degree. Now, performance theorists like Richard Schechner have long noted that the artificiality of performance serves an important function, to tell the audience that what they're witnessing is not real in any sort of quotidian, everyday sense, but rather is a special event staged in a distinct landscape. In the case of violence, that landscape gives a kind of psychological cover for spectators to consume and even enjoy sights and deeds they would otherwise find repulsive. It's a mental mechanism of proven utility, and I see no reason to assume that it applied to the Romans any less than to ourselves. That the Romans bracketed lethal combats with non-violent forms of spectacle, but this is the point. Apuleius describes the elaborate non-violent pantomime of Mount Ida that preceded the scheduled execution by repeated coupling with the donkey in the arena of a multiple murderess. Philo, a, a Jewish writer from Alexandria, reports that a spectacle was staged in the theater there that opened with the morning show of Jews scourged, stretched, bound to wheels, and beaten before being led off for execution. Then there was a lunch break, and then came the dancers, mimes, flute players, and plays. An inscription from Pompeii. Unfortunately, it's cut off here. You can't read it uh, very well, but an inscription from Pompeii. Um, commemorates spectacles that were put on there featuring an impressive variety of performers. There are pantomimes, actors, clowns, as well as bullfighters, boxers, gladiators, and animal hunts. The, uh, the critical function of staging, sorry, the, uh, the, the critical function of theatricality and staging in these events is to establish among the spectators a mental detachment from what they are watching. That way, empathy for the victims is reduced or even negated so that pantomimes and clowns on the one hand and beast fighters and gladiators on the other become melded into a single type in the Roman mind. Spectacular, things worth watching. This process is illustrated by a related contemporary phenomenon called internet body horror. Now, there are websites that assemble images and videos of real violence, such as the aftermath of car crashes, suicides caught on tape, or perhaps most infamously, beheadings that were carried out by Islamics. Uh, um, extremists around the time of the Iraq war about a decade ago. Some of these beheading videos were getting hits of 60,000 an hour, 
at when they were first posted, and one of them was downloaded 15 million times. Now, on the surface, this phenomenon appears to counter the interpretation of theatricality just given, in that the images are presented raw and unpackaged. But of course, they're not. They're part of a website. They're packaged for us in various ways. Uh, and uh, they are said uh, in a very distinct context, and they're, of course, catering to certain kinds of tastes. But more importantly, the mediation of the computer screen establishes the necessary detachment that allows some of these images to be viewed with a certain equanimity. The message boards of these sites are also very instructive in that they reveal a wide variety of reactions to the gruesome images presented there by those who are looking at them. And these range from titillation and entertainment to excitement and arousal to disgust and repulsion, but the latter experienced as partly being pleasurable. The dynamic psychological lore of watching real violence could hardly be clearer from these comments. And like it or not, there are those among us even today who find that lore irresistible. Uh, to be sure, there are particular features of Roman life that powerfully molded their attitudes. We'll end with their crowd again. Uh, that powerfully molded their attitudes toward what they were watching on the arena floor. Uh, ubiquitous slavery, the hierarchical caste of Roman social thought that calibrated individual worth against group membership, the absence of ready access to palliatives, and the close proximity of death, which would have made them, I think, more familiar with pain and suffering of others uh, than we are today. As Stephen Pinker argues in his recent book, The Better Angels of Our Nature, uh, the cultural norms of the Romans when it comes to violence were far removed from ours. But there is nevertheless a powerful overlap in the way theatricality and artificiality functioned at the Roman games and in modern forms of violent spectacle that brings the baying crowds of the Colosseum somewhat closer to home than many of us might like to admit. Thank you for your attention. <laughs>